So here we see Paul coveting, desiring, pleading for the prayers of God's people. Because Paul knows that God has called him to something that is greater than Paul. And if the mission that God has called Paul to is going to be accomplished, it's not going to be accomplished by Paul or by his abilities. It's going to require that God is engaged. You have right back here behind me, right? The possible with God, all things are possible with God. But my friend, without God, nothing is possible for us, right? Nothing that can glorify his name. And so Paul here is is asking for prayer. We find him doing it in Ephesians, in Romans, in Colossians, all through the New Testament, asking, pleading for the prayers of God's people. I want you to listen to a quote here that I have. When we rely upon organization, we get what organization can do. When we rely upon education, we get what education can do. When we rely upon eloquence, we get what eloquence can do, and so on. But when we rely upon prayer, we get what God can do. And my friends, today we need what God can do. Our churches today, we need what God can do. All right? I'm just telling you, I I pastored there in the Kansas City area. And uh, every uh, week we had a couple of different prayer meetings during the week. We had one for men and then we had a general one on Wednesday, Wednesday evening. I'm just telling you, it was the hardest meeting to get people to was the prayer meeting. Right? It just was. And and then we wonder why the church is not progressing and why the gospel is not going out. And and look at the culture today in America. I I think today in America, it used to be that the church impacted the culture. But today, the culture is impacting the church. Instead of the church is seeing a change, even a moral change in the culture that surrounds it, we find the church being impacted by the culture. Isn't that sad? Well, I I think you can point at one chief reason why. It's because the church has ceased to cry out to God. We've got all these different organ plans and, you know, philosophies and things we're we're working on to kind of manipulate things. But my friend, it begins on our hands and knees, on our faces before God, crying out before the throne of grace. And Paul knows this. Think about this. When you pray... All three persons of the Godhead go into action. Think about that. Eternal, omnipotent God. Immortal, right? When the child of God gets on his face before God, when he comes before the throne of grace, all three persons of the Godhead are engaged. Man, that should just overwhelm us. (laughs) You're coming here and here you come before the throne of grace. Well, who's there to receive your prayer? God the Father. He welcomes you to come. He pleads for you to come, right? He says, come boldly to my throne of grace. Well, what's the Son doing when we come boldly before that throne of grace? He authorizes our prayer. Because we're coming boldly by His blood. We're coming boldly by His righteousness. We're coming boldly in His name. He said, whatever you ask in my name, it shall be given unto you. So when we are praying there to the Father, and we're praying in the name of the Son, and by the blood of the Son, and by the righteousness of Christ, here He is our advocate with the Father, saying, Father, receive this prayer. Receive it just as if it was me, because they're praying in my name. So He's authorizing our prayer. What's God the Spirit doing? Well, he's perfecting our prayer. Romans 8 tells us that he takes our prayer, he perfects it, and he presents it before the throne of grace with words that we can't even humanly utter. Think about that. You know, you think, well, that wasn't a very good prayer. My friend, if you were praying from your heart in honesty to the Lord, don't worry about how you communicated it. The Spirit of God is going to take that prayer and perfect it for the glory of Christ. So my friends, when we are praying, the Godhead is in action working. That's why Satan, you know what? That's the one thing I think, you know, preaching, he tries to hinder preaching, yes, but I think in a greater way, he works to discourage from prayer because he knows that prayer is gonna bring change. So we see Paul here asking for that prayer. Now look specifically what Paul is asking prayer for. Number one, that the word of the Lord may have what? Free course. What's that mean? That the gospel would be unhindered. In the book of Colossians, I believe he states it this way, the same thought, that there would be open doors of utterance. 
So Paul is saying here, pray that the word of the Lord would have free course. Pray for me to have opportunities to preach the gospel, for there be these, these, these wonderful gifts from God of open doors just to proclaim Christ and who he is. Listen, in our world today, what, about eight billion people, it is estimated that 70% of the world's population has not heard a true gospel presentation. 70%. Now listen, when our Lord gave the commandment to the church 2,000 years ago, it was to go where with the gospel? To go into all the world, to preach it to every creature. And here we are 2,000 years later, and we've only fulfilled 30% of the commission? Now listen, I'm from Missouri, show me state, right? A 30% on your test is a fail. Now, California, I'm not sure what they'd give you out here in California. <laughs> We're a little different out here in California, right? But a 30% is failing. Listen, the church is failing. Let me ask you this question. Would God call us to do something that he doesn't enable us to do? Would he command us to do something? And by the way, this is a commandment to go into all the... We don't have to pray about it. It's a commandment to go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Would he command us to do something but not enable us to do it? I believe all the laborers needed are already in the church. I believe all the funds and monies that are needed are already in the church. I really do. Think about that 70% that have not heard a clear gospel presentation. They take that 70% and about 30% of the 70 or would be those who live in an area with the potential to hear the gospel, just they haven't heard it yet. I've got a very good friend in uh, Topeka, Kansas. He said he, was, he grew up Catholic, said he was 36 years old before he heard the gospel for the first time. So he grew up going to public schools, all the rest of it, ball teams, all that. Uh, you don't think there were Christians, that those that had gone to evangelical types of churches that couldn't have shared the gospel with him? And here we are, 30%. I know in Kansas City area where I pastored there, there were those that I believe I shared the gospel with that had potentially never heard the gospel before in their lives. Pastor just shared, preaching the gospel at the funeral. Probably those that were there, they'd maybe never heard that true gospel before. So about 30% of the world had the potential to hear, they never have heard. But 40% that have not heard, 40 of the 70%, they are unreached. They are areas where it's just impossible for them. They, they'll go from cradle to grave. They have no potential to hear the gospel of Jesus Christ. God opened a door for us in Laos, and we, we have a Bible institute there, and we travel there, and we, it's been a real great blessing to be there. It's estimated somewhere around 83% of the 126 or so people groups in Laos are unreached with the gospel. Isn't that amazing? Well, how can it be that way? Let me ask you this question. How many of you like Coca-Cola? Anybody like Coca-Cola? Some of you like Coca-Cola. I'm not a big Coke guy, but listen to the illustration. Coca-Cola was invented about 140 years ago. Do you know that it's estimated today that 97% of the world recognizes the Coca-Cola logo? I've been to places in Laos or Tajikistan or, or uh, Ukraine you know, smallest of villages, whatever. you can usually find Coke about anywhere. So my question for you tonight is this, how did Coca-Cola make it to 97% of the world in about 145 years, but the gospel of Jesus Christ has had 2,000 years and we've only completed about 30% of the mission? How can that be, right? Well, my friends, it's gonna begin with prayer. Falling on our knees before God saying, God, open these doors. That's right. God, open doors of utterance. Yes. God, open, may the word, your word, have free course, Lord. Satan is hindering the gospel, right. and he does. Right. He doesn't want the gospel to be right. preached. He hinders it through governments and through different yeah. means and methods, the fear of man and so forth. But listen, God is greater, That's right. and prayer can bring these hindrances yeah. down and open these doors to That's preach right. the gospel. Look at number two here. Pray for it to have free course and be glorified even as it is with you. So number one, for the opportunity to proclaim it. Number two, for the power to proclaim it. 
Paul tells the church in Thessalonica in his first letter, when I came to you, I didn't come in word only, but I came in power and I came in the spirit. My friend, when you are preaching in places like Laos or when you're preaching in places even like Ukraine and their their eyes have been blinded by the God of this world, what can pierce this darkness? It is the power of God. The power of God blessing the word of God. And and we see so much today in our our Christianity where we live in, where so much is put on the the different methods of evangelism and so forth, so little emphasis placed on the need of the hand and power of the Spirit of God to be at work. I was reading a story of of a missionary evangelist by the name of James Stewart, and he was over in Eastern Europe. This is before World War II, and he said he came to a church in Eastern Europe, and they had invited him to preach that Sunday morning. He said when he preached that Sunday morning, he had such freedom, and there was power that, that morning in that, in that service. He said that night they invited him back. He said, I came early because I wanted that same hand of God we had in the morning. And so I went down into the basement of the church. And as I came down into the basement, I I saw the furnace area back in the corner. And I, I walked towards it because there there was some light. He said, as I came to that furnace area, I saw three ladies on that basement floor with their faces on the floor crying out to God in prayer. And he said, then I understood why I had such power this morning. My friends, we should hunger for it, for the gospel to be glorified in hearts, even as it is with us, right? How many of you believe that prayer changes things? And if we're truly hungering for prayer, we're coming before our triune God and we're crying out for his name and his gospel to be glorified in hearts. Well, let's look at a third thought right here as we come down to verse number two. He says, and that we may be delivered from unreasonable and wicked men, for all men have not faith. The third thing Paul is asking prayer for here is that he would be preserved and protected. Listen, the gospel of Jesus Christ is confronting that culture and calling that culture to repentance. Listen, you bring this message of Christ and what is it saying to the Ukrainian? It's saying, I am lost in my sin, guilty before a holy God and my gods, my icons cannot save, my good works cannot save and I'm turning from that wrong thinking and from my sin and I'm coming to Christ and Christ alone for my salvation. You come into Buddhist or Buddhism and and it's the same thought. It's putting away the the gods and the the Buddhas and my wrong thinking, my sin. I'm, I'm guilty before God. It's turning and it's coming fully to Jesus Christ. Well, listen, this doesn't always make you popular. You're not always going to be popular, right? Does does the culture here, does everyone love you when you bring them this good news? No, there's going to be many that reject. Now, praise God, there's always going to be some that are going to receive, and that's why we go. For the joy of seeing those who receive Christ and trust Christ. But many times, it's not going to make you popular. And so Paul is saying here, pray. We just had a, a, a missionary, independent Baptist missionary in Baghdad here, just what, about a month and a half or so ago, was shot in a car right next to his wife. Listen, it's, uh, it's a dangerous world out there, right? You're not going to be popular with the world. But I believe we should be praying for our missionaries. God, preserve them, keep them. I've already shared with you our servants in Ukraine, praying for them. God, preserve them, keep them. Julie and I were traveling, and we came over a bridge on a Saturday afternoon. That evening, that bridge detonated and exploded. Uh, we were in our, on, in our office. It was a Sunday morning. I was in the office early. I heard off in the distance these kabooms, explosions. I looked out through my window, three bombs or missiles that had hit in the northern part of the city. So it's dangerous right now in Ukraine. Pray for the servants there in Ukraine, for God to preserve them and keep them during this time because all men have not the faith. Let me read to you this quote very quickly. A quote here, and it states this, and I I love this quote. Almost everyone believes that prayer is important, but there is a difference between believing that prayer is important and believing it is essential. Essential means there are things that will not happen without prayer. Now, we would all agree that prayer is important, but how many of us really believe that prayer is essential? What does essential mean? 
There are things that are not going to happen unless we pray. Do you really believe that? There are souls that are not going to be reached on these foreign mission fields unless we're praying back here. There, There are churches that are not going to be begun unless we're praying back here. Essential means there are things that will not happen without your prayers. Listen, God has called us all to be active in missions. Some of us are called to go, and we willingly go. Praise God for the call. We willingly go to the reaches, to the, to the regions beyond. But for those of us who are called to stay, we still participate in missions, not only by our financial gifts and giving, which is important, but I would say even more important yeah. is our prayer commitment to pray. That's right. Paul told those Romans in the book of Romans, he said, strive together with me in your prayers to God for me. That word strive is to agonize with me. It's a word used to describe a Greek team competitions when we're we're laboring together, each one doing his part. Paul is saying, my part is to go to take this gospel. Your part is to lift me up in prayer as I go. But we're all agonizing together for the glory of Jesus Christ. Well, if Paul goes and he's agonizing, but those that were on the team that are not doing their role in praying, the mission is not going to be as successful because essential prayers are not being lifted up back home. I want you to think for a moment about the book of Exodus in the 17th chapter. There we find uh, Moses who, who goes up on the hill to pray. We find Joshua going down into the valley to do battle against the Amalekites. He takes with him, Joshua does the army of Israel in the sword to go do battle. While he's down there, Moses is up on the hill. Hands are lifted up to God, representing prayer and dependence on God. As Moses' hands are up in the air, what's happening with Joshua down below? Victory. He's winning. But Moses gets tired. And Moses' arms come down. And immediately what begins to happen to Joshua starts to lose. Then Aaron and Hur come alongside Moses and help him get his hands back up into the air. And as soon as his hands are lifted back up and prayers are now ascending again unto God, what happens to Joshua? Victory until the victory is won. So here's my question tonight. Where was the victory won? Well, some would say, well, it was Joshua. He had the sword and he was battling and he won the victory. But my friend, really, where was the victory won? The victory was won up on the hill. And so you have missionaries that have been called and your church is supporting them and you have recognized that call by your support and they have gone down into the valley to do the hand-to-hand combat. That's kind of what missions is like, right? Facing the enemy right down there. I mean, you go to some of these places in Tajikistan or into uh, Laos or different parts of the world, Ukraine. I mean, it is hand-to-hand combat. They willingly go and they are glad to go. But listen, what about those up on the hill who've been called to stay? If the victory is going to be won, it's going to be by those who are at home praying essential prayers. Lifting up that country and that field for open doors of utterance, that the word of the Lord would have free course, that the gospel would be glorified, that they be protected from these evil and wicked men, for all men have not the faith. The victory will be won where? Back home, up on the hill with supporting churches who are lifting you up in prayer. My friends, in my life, in our ministry, Julie and mine, I have never had a time where I've more needed the prayers of God's people than now. Because I need the hand and blessing of God. There are opportunities that we have right now that we've, we've never had before. And what we need is not just important prayers, we need essential prayers. That's right being breathed out before the throne of grace for the glory of Christ in hearts and in lives. And something should stir us within to fall before our God and to cry out for his hand and his power, for doors to be open. You know where we need to begin in our prayer? Asking forgiveness. Lord, we have failed. Listen, I've heard it said this way, and I I, I agree with it. This generation of Christians is responsible for this generation of lost souls on earth. We are accountable. Yes, maybe the church has not completed the mission in the past, but this is today, right? This is us. 
We have a mission that God has called us to. How are we going to complete this mission? You're saying, well, it's too great of a mission. I'll agree. It's too great for us, but it's not too great for our God. And our God is calling us to do it. And my friend, if we'll get on our hands and knees and if we'll cry out to God and we'll intercede for his grace, we'll pray these essential prayers, his mission can be completed through us. Do you desire that tonight? Do you want that tonight? Yes. You know, the saddest part is we'll leave here tonight and and many of us just content with the way things are. I remember when God was stirring my heart and, and, and I remember when I began to understand, you know what, my life, I've been wasting my life. And I remember thinking, I actually prayed this and I'm sorry if I delayed his second coming, but I began to pray, Lord, don't come back yet. Give me an opportunity to serve you. I want to show you from my life how much you mean to me, right? Yes. I want to show you. And my friend, I hope you have that desire tonight. Amen. Let's show the Lord how much we love him and appreciate him. And it begins in prayer, crying out for his grace and his glory and missions.